Welcome everybody, it's office hours time again. Favorite time of the month for me. Uh, love getting in touch with the community, but I will be traveling again soon. So uh, this is not that this is the last office hours, but uh, I've, you know, I've done my dash with virtual. So I'll be actually going to a conference at some stage soon. So I'm very excited about that. Welcome, as always, sing out if you can't see me, sing out if you can't hear me. Oh, my head will do this throughout the session as I jump back and forth to the chat line. Uh, always like having these sessions interactive, so any comments, questions, etc., throw them in the chat. Or the Q&A, I don't really care either way, um, will be shared. You know, we're all friends here, we'll share all the questions and we'll go through any answers that you have, any commentary you have throughout the session as well. Uh, once again, Thanks for giving up your time. I, I get paid to do this. I have to be able to do it if I, even, though, even, if, even if I wasn't getting paid, but I get paid to do this. So I appreciate you giving up your time and hopefully, uh, yeah, we bring our communities a bit closer together because we like talking about Oracle tech. Without further ado, let me share my screen and we'll get into the usual bits and pieces. One moment. Okay, as I say, once again, if you can't see them, um, yell out in the chat line and I'll do my best to fix it, but hopefully you can. As always, I say getting in touch is easy. That's my Twitter handle, Connor underscore MC underscore D. For everything else, Instagram, Facebook, blog post, email, podcast, um, TikTok, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, just go to linktree slash Connor or scan the QR code. That'll give you the 10,000 ways you can get in touch with me on various social media channels. Uh, probably the easiest one for just grabbing, you know, if you have a quick question or something is, uh, Twitter's probably the easiest. My DMs are always open. Uh, so yeah, feel free to contact me whenever you want. For those that aren't regulars on my Office Hour session, first of all, welcome. Thank you for joining this Office Hour session. And you'll see throughout the deck, throughout the, um, the hour, the content is often pushed down to the left or at the bottom of the slide, it looks a bit weird. Uh, that's because we turned this into a video and at the video, we put my ugly mug on the top right hand side. So it all balances out in the end, but yeah, if you're on this live Zoom call, it'll just might look a little bit odd, but hopefully all the content will still be visible and valuable. Some bits and pieces that I always like to start off the session before we jump into the tech. I've got a lot to cover, so I've got to get through this fairly quickly. Um, you may have seen just today, actually, uh, on the Twitter sphere and various things, uh, you can now submit for Oracle Cloud World, uh, Oracle Open World, if you're by a previous name. Uh, that'll be in October in Las Vegas, I think, this year. Um, venue yet to be announced, but I think it's somewhere in, in Las Vegas. I'd imagine it'll be somewhere near the Strip. So could be uh, if you've never been to Las Vegas, good time to go. But yeah, um, we've obviously got some Oracle speakers who'll be doing a lot of content, but the call for papers for the community has now gone out. So if you're keen on doing a talk at Oracle Cloud World, uh, jump over to there and put a paper in. I think it's open till about June. So get in there snappy. We'd love to see you giving a talk at open world, sorry, cloud world. Things coming up, uh, if you're in Europe, hopefully you can get along to Apex World, which is I guess, May 24th, 25th, just next week, I think. Uh, I've been there before, fantastic little event. Uh, Netherlands is a beautiful place as well. If you're an Apex or just an Oracle developer, get along to that event. Uh, they do a fantastic job there. Shout out to Roll and Alex and the others who uh, help run that event. In terms of a call for papers, if, if you've ever wanted to see the world, uh, and you're involved with the Oracle community, this is the way to do it. Uh, the Latin American Oracle user community run a multi-country, multi-city event uh, coming up, I think, in mid-August. The call for papers is currently out. I cannot vouch for this event enough. It is just fantastic. In terms of what you would be able to do, this is what happens. It starts in Brazil, then goes to uh, Uruguay, then Argentina, then Paraguay, then Chile, then Mexico, then... Costa Rica, Panama, and I think finishes in Colombia. So that is insane. But all of these communities and those places are just fantastic people. Uh, here's a picture from when I last went, I think in 2019, maybe 2018, I can't remember. There's Sandesh, but uh, just behind the, next to Sandesh, you'll see Rita from Argentina. She helps the user group there in Argentina. Behind them is Nelson and Edelweiss, uh, people from the user community in Uruguay. Every single one of these South American communities are just amazing in terms of the hospitality you show you as a speaker and the way they support their local communities. So if you have any chance, I cannot stress, if you live in South America, uh, go along to these events, obviously, but if you're a speaker, can't encourage you enough. Just absolutely breathtaking, wonderfully nice people. 
Another call for papers, UK OG Island comes up uh, later in the year, but the call for papers finishes in just a couple of weeks. So if you live in the UK or in Europe, submit for that, please. Once again, support your local user group. Things for me coming up, I'll be doing a virtual talk for the Spanish Oracle user group uh, in just a few weeks, I think, on 20C features. And then I'll be off to Kscope. Uh, that'll be in Texas. So yeah, if you're in the United States uh, or if you're going to Kscope, please come say hello. Uh, it'll be my first travel for a long, long, long time. And so cannot wait to get involved face to face with the community. Uh, and finally, just after that, I'll be doing the a Indian equivalent of the Latin American Oracle user community tour. This is in the end of July, and that starts at Chennai, Bangalore, uh, Delhi, Pune, Mumbai, and I think we finish in Hyderabad. I can't remember. But yeah, once again, jumping all over India. I think we do six cities in about seven days. Uh, so it's just going to be manic, but always a great deal of fun. Why do I keep talking about all this kind of stuff at the start of every office hours? Please support your local user groups. Cannot stress that enough. Uh, I should do a whole office hour session on user groups one day, but these are people that primarily are uh, giving up their time for free. They're volunteers in the main. Some user groups have funding, but the vast majority are just volunteers. And all they're really trying to do is make you prosper with the Oracle technology you're working with. It's literally like a free help desk. And uh, so, yeah, so please support your local user groups, make some new friends, build those communities, because that's how we all thrive and prosper. And, and I think putting aside just success without our jobs, it also just makes our jobs that much more enjoyable. So please support your local user groups and I won't have to pontificate about it every office hours, but you can rest assured I probably will. Finally, a little bit of self-promotion. Podcast is out. Latest episode is the Read Consistency Model. So if you don't like looking at me, uh, but you don't mind listening to me, uh, that's a longer form version of uh, technical content uh, for your workout, walking, commute to work, et cetera, et cetera. Good morning from San Diego, California. There we go. Yeah, fantastic. And in the Q&A already, is there a user group for Southern California? That is a good question, but I will, I will find out for Southern California. I would imagine so, but um, I'll find out. That's an excellent question, Rachel. I'll find out and I'll tweet it out. Let me just make a quick note. Southern California. Good question. If anyone knows, feel free to chip in. Now, a word of warning. Go back to the slides. This might look a little unusual. This is the broken components of my coffee machine. It's been broken for two days. I'm waiting on a replacement part. So I haven't had a coffee for two days. So I will apologize in advance. You know, anyone that asks a question on the Q&A and I'm like, I don't care. I don't wanna know <laughs> if I shout or I swear or I curse tonight, please blame it on the lack of caffeine. Hopefully the parts will arrive before next month's office hours, but let's rest assured. Uh, I've been doing it tough for the last 48 hours. Okay, let's get into what we're gonna talk about tonight. And then I'll have a quick look and see what's on the Q&A line, et cetera. So we've got eight topics to try to cover. Uh, some of them are fast. I'd love to see if we can get through eight, but so I'm gonna go quick. Uh, but we're gonna talk about sorting bad data, deleting old records. Uh, that's an interesting, that's really just a summary of what Chris Saxon did uh, last night. Uh, using the ROID, some interesting findings about the ROID and why you probably want to uh, reassess your usage of it, the relationship between sequences and tables, an interesting issue with LPAD and RPAD when it comes to PIL SQL, how the with statement might not work in DML, or maybe it should, an interesting strange issue with what we call the check syntax. Uh, the word check you might think of in terms of constraints, but it can be used elsewhere, but we're going to find out whether you should. And finally, we're going to talk about what happens and how to avoid your connection pool becoming overloaded. So a nice disparate set of topics there. First thing on the Q&A. Hi Connor, having migrated to AWS RDS, I'm not aware whether there's a need to continue tuning SGA or PGA with the traditional parameters. I don't know much about RDS because obviously that's a competitor, but my understanding is RDS is a managed service. So I would imagine Amazon are responsible for looking after the SGA and PGA split. If you're an RDS person, feel free to jump on the chat and either agree with that comment or counter it. Um, but yeah, my understanding is if you're using RDS on Amazon, uh, it's their responsibility, not yours. Uh, if they mess it up, you need to speak to them. 
Oh, can I please post the link for the podcast again? Someone said. Um, easy way, just search for The Spoken Nerd on any of your popular podcast platforms, Apple, Amazon, Spotify, et cetera, et cetera. The Spoken Nerd, or just search for Connor McDonald and you'll find the link. Okay, let's get into our first topic. How are we going for time? 10 past, oh yeah, we're gonna go. So sorting bad data. Here's the question that came in. I have a table of data, which is mostly numeric, but it is stored in a varchar2 column because occasionally we get some data which is non-numeric. How can I sort the data in numeric order where possible? The moment this question came in, I knew exactly what the requirement was and I know exactly what someone means when they say, I'd like to sort it numerically because I would imagine the data is coming in from something like Excel. Here's some sample data coming in. It's partly numeric, partly non-numeric. And one of the cool things in Excel is you can say, look, if anything looks like a number, sort it as a number, the rest just put it at the bottom. And you can see the result there. We get one, two, three, four, five through, and the numbers come out first, and then all the rest gets sorted sort of roughly in order. So I'd be willing to bet this data has come either via an Excel spreadsheet or at some point in its life was in an Excel spreadsheet. And we'd like to do the equivalent in SQL to be able to sort it in numeric order where possible. So there are various methods to do this. And I thought I'd show you some of the methods that have sort of been used over the years and probably where uh, some of the gotchas in some of the old methods. So let's fire up our first demo for the night and we'll give it a go. Hopefully that font is suitably large enough. So I'm going to create a table, which is the exact same content I had pasted into that Excel spreadsheet. So you can see there's some numerics in there floating around. There's some just purely text and there's a mix of numbers and numerics as well. And I'm just using the sys ODCI varchar2 list. It's a pre, it's a uh, pre-delivered varchar2 array as an easy way of populating the data. So we do select star from T and there's our data in a random order and we would like to assign some order to it, picking up the numbers at the top. If I just do order by one, you can see the problem. It doesn't have the smarts that Excel would have. And whenever you have numeric data stored in a varchar2, you're obviously sorting it actually by ASCII sequence or whatever your character set sequencing is. So it sort of looks like it's roughly in order 1, 10, 11, et cetera, until I get to 12, because 1, 2 trails 1, 0, and 1, 1, and 1, 1, 1, 1, et cetera. So I've sorted, sorted it effectively in string order as opposed to a character set order as opposed to numeric order. Here's probably one of the uh, time-honored ways that we strip out numeric data from varchar2 data in the Oracle database. So I'm going to, first of all, trim any trailing spaces or leading spaces of my formula, I'm going to use what's called a translate function. And what translate does is simply take any of these characters, if it finds them, and translate them to a zero. So what that does is effectively says, take every single numeric number that's in there, numeric digit, change it to a zero. Then I'm wrapping that with replace. Replace all the zeros with nothing. I've left out the final character. So effectively, I'm saying, rip everything out that's a digit. Now, if at the end of that exercise, I have nothing left, I can assume that this thing is entirely digits and therefore it's most probably numeric. Uh, we'll put aside for the sec second the concept of uh, things like decimal points and currency indicators, et cetera. We're keeping this example nice and simple. So if we think this thing is entirely consists of digits, what we'll do is we'll pad it out. We'll left pad it out such that all the digits now become right aligned, therefore things like um, things with three digits will now sort after things with say one digit. So this is probably the, the most common method you would see to either sort by numerics, extract numerics, et cetera, et cetera, that we used to use uh, in the earlier versions of Oracle. Replace, translate, change all the digits to zero, change the zeros to null, and you get all the numbers coming out first up to there, and then we get all the strings coming out at the end. This is a, a a time-honored classic uh, in terms of sorting numeric data, which might contain some non-numerics. This is probably what people have moved to once we got to say Oracle 9 or 10, when we started the introduction of things like regular expressions. We can do the same thing with just a little bit more um, convenient syntax. Effectively, once again, if this thing consists of solely digits, effectively digits, any number of them, 
from start to the end of the string. Then once again, we'll sort by the L padding of X. We get the same result. It pops out numbers first and then the strings later. So this is probably the thing you're more likely to see from Oracle 9, 10, 11 onwards. It's really the same logic, just a much sort of slightly more convenient syntax. Oh, I need to make scroll a little bit large again. Now, here's a slightly interesting variation that actually came from a Ask Tom customer uh, when we we're having this discussion uh, on Ask Tom. And that is, well, you might actually want to sort the strings also with some semblance of numeric order as well. In the previous example, for example, 1ABC was sorting after 11ABC. And similarly, 22 was coming before 2. This slight extension here, where we're effectively saying, okay, are there any leading numbers in there, even though it's not in completely numbers, then we'll decide which way we're going to sort it. So if you've seen this thing in the past where we just sort by that, sorry, if we just sort by that, then yes, that takes care of the numbers, but it might not take care of the, um, let's call them semi-numbers, things that start with numerics, but then trail off with non-numerics. If you want to sort them as numeric, probably as num numerically as you possibly can, uh, then this is the way to do it. We're actually adding in a little bit more logic at the end if the thing starts with numbers but might not necessarily have other numbers at the end of it. Why have I got this one? Yeah, so here is now return to the previous version of replace and trim, but I'm using a different mechanism as opposed to using LPAD. What I'm doing now is actually putting two number. So if it is numeric, I'm actually going to convert it to a numeric number and then sort by that which gives me what looks like the exact same result. So why would I do this? Why would I not just choose, for example, the LPAD thing, which seems to give the same result? Well, here's the interesting thing, and unfortunately I don't have multiple machines to do it on. Two number takes care of sorting when it comes to different versions of character sets and different hardware platforms. Because don't forget, some platforms have, for example, things like byte swapping with Windows platforms versus, say, big Unix platforms. You can actually get different sorting sequences when you come to sorting strings. What that means is anything like LPAD or RPAD as a mechanism of sorting, but you're sorting in what you hope to be a numeric order, is not guaranteed to be platform and character set independent. So while they all work here, because I'm all running just on, on Windows, you need to be careful if you're running this across, say, multiple platforms or multiple character sets. Using two number is the only cast iron guaranteed way of making sure you actually sort numbers as numbers. So I put this in there just to reinforce the fact that if you have some digits, try and convert them to digits. Can I talk about byte swapping? I will, I'll talk about byte swapping once I finish this demo. If you're now on 12C or above, you can make it even much easier now because things like two number have a effectively a catch-all syntax to let you um, fail a two-number operation without crashing the entire query. So I can say, order by two-number, try convert X to a number. If it works, I get X at the end of it. If it, not, if it doesn't work, I'm going to default to a very high value on a conversion error. Once again, I get some nice sorting now. Right? So it's simply going to do that. And then I sort by X as a secondary option. So I could do that. Obviously, now I need to know what some sort of high value is, something that's going to be higher than any of the possible numbers in my list. So you can do it this way. I, I still like this because we're not, now not doing replace, trim, regio expression, et cetera, et cetera. It's fairly obvious what we're trying to do. We're saying if it's a number, use it. Otherwise, default to some other number. If you don't want to have that unknown high number in there, you can then use the validate conversion option, which is if I can validate this thing as a number, then convert it to a number. In this way, I'm guaranteeing that I'm not going to have my two number function crash. So there are some more, more recent examples, ones that I'd recommend, two number with the default on error or validate conversion. Uh, I think just more clean and lean options than the conventional dinosaur models that I used to use in terms of regular expressions, replace, trim, et cetera, et cetera. Let me just go back to the slides, make sure I cover off any points, and then we'll answer Rachel's question. So the method has improved over the years. Validate conversion to number with default is probably the way to go in my opinion. As I said, you need to be careful with strings because not all of us are just using good old single byte US7 ASCII anymore, etc. So to answer your question, Rachel, 
Um, the way we store data on a, and this is unrelated to a database, this is just platform uh, information. Um, the way we store data on a platform by platform basis is we have a thing called little and big endian format. And really it's, if I've got a byte of information, or for example, I think it's, is it a byte or a nibble? I can't remember. It's either a byte or two bytes, I can't remember now. If I've got a byte of information, how do I store that on a Windows or Intel machine, which is a little endian box, versus a big Solaris AIX machine, which is a big endian box? The way we do it is the way the bits are aligned is on one platform they look like this, another platform they look like that. It's the same data, but it's the way the platform actually stores, uh, chooses to store that information. That's why you can't take an Oracle database file from say Solaris and simply copy it over to your Linux or Windows machine and use it because every single byte needs to be flipped. Uh, if you search for Endian or Little Endian, Big Endian, you'll see uh, which platforms uh, have um, their various infrastructure like that. So it's unrelated to databases, but because databases sit on top of operating systems, uh, we need to respect the Endian format, which can affect things like character set and sorting information. Hopefully that makes sense. How are we going for time? Behind already, okay. This one will be hopefully fairly fast. Deleting old data. Here's the question that came in, literally came in today on a Twitter DM. We need to regularly delete the data in our table that is more than two weeks old. I watched an Office Hours webinar showing lots of different recommendations. Uh, shout out, I think this is probably Chris Saxon, uh, his webinar last night. Can you please advise on the best method out of all those methods? And my simple answer to that is no. If there was just a best method, then that would be the only method we, we would have in the Oracle database. We would simply take away all the others. And there is no best method. There are only methods that you should scientifically know how to apply and make decisions on. So just a very, like within two minutes, hopefully, rattle through some of the options that Chris covered, plus some others as well, just to give you an idea of the mindset you wanna be tackling when it comes to deleting. You'll see on a million blogs out there saying, if you need to archive off data, then delete is the slowest and worst option. Well, that might be true, but if, you need, if your definition of de deleting two weeks of data is 1% of your entire table, if two weeks of data is, is some tiny portion, rest assured, delete is the absolute best option because anything else is probably gonna be far more inefficient. If you just have a tiny percentage of data to remove, delete's probably your way to go. However, conversely, if deleting two weeks of data is the vast majority of your table, well, yeah, delete probably is the slowest and worst option. Does that mean you immediately discount it? No, because it might be the worst option, but it might not be. Why is that? What if I've got triggers on this table that has to capture every single DML for say security or audit reasons? Well, you don't wanna be doing truncate on that because suddenly you've broken your audit system. You might need your triggers to fire. Even though that's gonna make it breathtakingly slow, you might have a compliance reason that says, yep, those triggers need to fire, which means you're stuck with delete. You might need to guarantee read consistency. Maybe while you're doing your archival process, you need everyone else to be able to still run queries against your data. You probably might wanna do this therefore in a single transaction or other online facilities. So maybe you do need to do a delete even though you'd rather not. But in a simple terms, if deleting a tiny amount means yes, I can use delete option. If I'm deleting a huge amount, means I don't use the delete option. That means somewhere in the middle, there's some sort of sweet spot. There's some sort of threshold at which I would still use delete and therefore, and, or not consider other options. So maybe it's exactly half the table. Maybe it's something else. Even that is a dramatically moving sort of thing, uh, line in the sand, because what if you've got dozens and dozens of indexes? Maybe that makes the deletes prohibitively slow. Maybe it's quicker to archive some other way and then rebuild those indexes. What if you've got a foreign key? What if it's a parent? Maybe delete you have to use because you've got issues with dealing with the child table and keeping it transactional. Maybe it takes trunk out off the table. Maybe it takes some other DDL options off the table. Maybe it's reference partition and therefore things like truncate at a partition level go back on the table. Lots of options. You need to explore what your particular scenarios are. So your options very, very briefly. Delete is definitely an option, but look at the percentage of the volume. Look at the indexes in use, whether you can use indexes. You don't want to scan the whole table. 
but also look at the indexes you need to retain or potentially rebuild at the end of that exercise. Do you need triggers? Do you have foreign keys involved? Do you have constraints that you want to keep active or do you have the opportunity of disabling them and then enabling them later? Lots of options here when it comes to delete. The other options that Chris talked about or other options you can consider are having a temporary table. Copy the data you want to keep into a temporary table, truncate your main table, load the data back in. That involves generally an outage. Can you take an outage? Do you have the spare space to do that? Do you have opportunities to do logging or no logging options? If your database is set to forced logging, then maybe this operation is not going to be useful for you because you have to do a lot of logging anyway. Forced logging might be in play if you're using, say, DataGuard. How many indexes and triggers and foreign keys, etc., do you have? Because they'll all need to be potentially turned off and then reinstated at the end of it. That overall turnaround time might actually cost you more in terms of outage than the delete. These are things you need to do in your test environment. What about parallelism? Maybe you can do things like deletes or DML or even archiving off with, say, you know, create table or select in parallel. It's a great way of supercharging the performance here. But parallel operations generally lock the data entirely, unlike other operations which leave it online. It's going to burn this hole in your server. Do you have the CPUs available to actually run parallel without impacting other parts of your business? The same issues with indexes, etc. apply. How frequent is it? Is it a one-off thing? If it's just a one-off thing, maybe just run the delete, who cares? Yeah, you know, it might run 10 hours, 12 hours, whatever. Maybe that's fine if it's just a one-off thing. If it's not, do you want to do this regularly? Then look at other options which might make it faster next time. Maybe this table should be partitioned. Maybe I don't need to archive the data at all. Maybe I just need to flag it as being eligible for removal and keep it somewhere. That way I have a less expensive option and maybe just use a view to hide it from view or use the Oracle row archival facilities to do something similar. So I just wanted to stress all those things because there's no best method. There's heaps of methods, each one which will be the best for particular circumstances. Cannot stress that enough. Probably my current first choice. So when someone says, I need to get rid of some data, what would you start with? What would be the first thing I would test to see if it's gonna suit my needs? It's probably related to partitioning. Now I say related to partitioning because I think we probably made a mistake here at Oracle. In 12.2, we said, look at this amazing facility now where you can convert a table that's non-partitioned to a partition table online, as well as just keeping some of the rows. And we made a huge fuss about this. Take any non-partition table, make a partition, do it online. How cool are we? The problem is, as a result, we didn't really spend a lot of time telling you that it wasn't just about converting to partition tables. It was actually for all tables. You can do this as well. Nothing to do with partitioning. I can take any heap table and say, I want to move it. I want to do it online. And I want to only keep these following rows. It's a great way of archiving off a subset or deleting a subset. So this is probably my current first option, my first port of call, because it's DDL, it's online, it's very, very simple to do, and effectively all the, the management in terms of indexing, foreign keys, all that kind of stuff is looked after for me. Now, if some, there are some restrictions as to when you can or cannot use this, and therefore if it fails, then I look at other options. But this is probably my first choice. The syntax is simple, it just works, and hopefully it's, you know, you, let's not call it best, but let's call it the simplest way forward, and you use this until maybe some other option or something stops you from doing it. So hopefully that explains the options that were there and probably uh, where I would start before pursuing other options. Q&A. For delete, is there a maximum number of rows you would recommend? Yeah, about that many. No, it, it's really a how long is a piece of string kind of discussion there. Uh, for some systems, for example, if, if you're running, say, a data warehouse, it might be running in no archive log mode, the cost of deleting is incredibly low, very, very low. I should note that delete is probably one of the more expensive DMLs, inserts cheaper. Um, DML uh, delete has to put more information into the undo area, which makes it a bit slower. But yeah, but by the same token, I might have a table with only a thousand rows, but it's got triggers, it's got foreign keys, they're on delete cascade, I've got 25 indexes, I'm, I'm running Siebel, anything like that, where they're just like, you know, there are so many potential caveats that make deleting, deleting even a small number of rows 
dramatically expensive. Um, so I know that sounds particularly vague, but that's unfortunately where we're at. Um, I would say, you know, do your research, do your homework, do some testing of the various methods in your test environment, and then make a, a logical call um, as opposed to a, a, hey, I saw someone on office hours say this is the best method. Um, use, use the smarts you pick up in this session, hopefully, to make a logical and informed decision. As I said, oh, there you go, I prompted the slide. Know your data and therefore you'll know the requirements and that's the best way forward. Okay, next one. Got to get through them. Using the row ID sounds simple. We often use the row ID value to efficiently update records after we've queried them. And most people who are developers will be familiar with this. The row ID points to a row, so you grab the row, use it to do an update, etc. I know Apex can do the same as well, but our DBA has just told us not to do it. They said you only use the row ID if you are doing block corruption checks. Are they correct? Standard answer, yes and no. Let's see why people use the row ID and let's see why there are some risks associated with it. So here's sort of the common knowledge when it comes to row IDs. I've got a row in a table and that row obviously sits somewhere in a file out on disk. It might be an ASM, might be raw, but it's generally a file somewhere on disk. Inside that file, we have a database block. That row must sit inside a block and therefore it sits somewhere inside that block. So the, th the three things you need to find a row in an Oracle database are what file it's in, what block in that file, typically an 8K block, and what row in that block is it. And that's what we call the row ID. The way indexes work is by storing that row ID associated with keys. So if I'm looking for this row, which is a lovely green key, I navigate my way down the index nice and efficiently. That tells me, oh, you'll find that row in file five, block 143, row number seven, and that's how we get it. So the premise of row IDs was originally about using them as a mechanism for indexes to find rows faster. The row ID is not stored on the table. There's no physical thing called the row ID. It's simply stored in the index to point to its, a row's physical location on disk. If you delete a row from a table, obviously its row ID disappears because it's sitting in an index area. And if you insert that same row values back, there's no guarantee it goes back in the same spot. So it probably will pick up a brand new row ID. That's delete and insert makes sense. The row ID is likely going to change because it's probably going to go somewhere else. It might go back in the same spot, but we don't know. If the row gets larger, hopefully you saw that green thing just get a little bit larger. So if, if the row expands like an update and can no longer fit back where it is, then as we know, the database will relocate that to a new block where it can fit or somewhere, maybe even the same block. And what happens is we leave a forwarding address. And that way we don't need to update the index. The index still points to the original spot. It gets there and we say, oh, that row got moved out of here because it got too fat and it gets pushed down to another block and we go follow the link. So all this is common knowledge as to how indexes use row IDs to find rows in a table. The only probably um, exceptional cases here that might be a little bit sort of out of the ordinary is if you have a partition table, for example, this is a single table comprised of two partitions. If you update the partition key, a row might need to change from one partition to another because they're different segments. By definition, the row must move from one block to another block because they belong to different segments. So this is one of the few times that updating a row might actually change the row ID because we're moving it from one partition to another. It becomes a delete and insert under the, under the covers. Another example is if you're using um, some of the advanced compression stuff on Exadata, hybrid columnar compression, then the rows are so tightly packed that when you update a row, we might have to take that row out and recompress it and put it somewhere else. So the row ID might change there as well. So there are lots of possible user-initiated causes for a row ID to change. If I do hybrid columnar compression, I update a row, it gets moved. If I do alter table shrink space, which simply says, take some rows and pack them down toward the front of the table, then by definition, some of those rows are going to move. If I flash back a table because I've made a mess of the data, the way the database does that internally is it deletes the bad stuff and inserts the good stuff. So it's a delete insert, the row IDs can change. If you move the rows in a the table, then by definition, you're actually reshuffling the blocks. So all these things are things that might change the row ID because you're initiating some sort of action. Most people are aware of this, but it doesn't impact the fact that we want to do um, updates and DML using the row ID as a way of getting to the rows very rapidly. 
But I want to show you a demo of something that you might not be familiar with and might uh, make you think twice about using the ROID in your applications. So let's start with this one. So I'm going to create a table here. Um, I've made it percent free zero because I'm going to update some rows and force them to be moved. So I'm going to create a table called T. I'm going to insert a couple of hundred rows. Every row has a hundred bytes on one of the particular columns. So that's going to be enough to fill up at least one block. Therefore, all those rows are tightly packed into one block with no real space for them to grow. Let's grab a random selection of four rows from that block and look at the row IDs. Now, obviously, memorizing row IDs is a little bit cryptic. So let's just remember these last thing. It's an A, X, Z, and a zero. So there's our four rows. Now I'm going to go through, and for every single row, I'm actually doubling the size of this 100 byte column. It now gets 200 bytes. So the vast majority of all these rows are going to have to be reshuffled to other blocks because they've all grown to be larger. The table has actually now doubled in size. So at least half the rows have been moved elsewhere. If I look at the row IDs, however, as we had in the slides, we showed that we don't actually change the row ID because what we're actually doing is simply moving the row somewhere else, but leaving a forwarding address for those rows. So effectively, the row ID remains unchanged because any indexes we don't want to actually modify. So the row ID remains unchanged, even though we've had to move them around inside the block or inside the table, because we don't want to affect any indexes that might have existed on this table. So the row IDs don't change. That's common knowledge, as we said. Let's make a slight modification to the demo now. Drop the table, exact same table definition, exact same data goes in. This time I'm going to alter table T enable row movement. Now, people who are unfamiliar with this will know that we normally use enable row movement on partition tables to allow rows to jump between partitions if you update the partitioning key. We don't normally use it on a heat table because it doesn't seem to do anything. Let's explore. So here's our same demo, A, X, Z, and zero. I update all the rows, make them all bigger. They have to get shuffled around inside the table. And even with enable row movement on, you can see the row ID doesn't change. This is probably what you're familiar with as an Oracle developer. That row ID always points to your row, which means it's safe for you to query the row ID from time to time to know where a row is, and then use that row ID as a quick way of getting back to that same row. Apex does it, Oracle Forms does it, etc. Let me fire up a new share. So this is the exact same demo. I'm now running this on an autonomous database, one of the cloud offerings that comes with Oracle. I have a free autonomous database. I encourage you all to get your own free autonomous database as well. Create my table, insert 100 byte rows all the way through. There's my row IDs here. Let's remember A, X, I, and G for those four random rows we picked out of it. I update all the rows, make them all twice as big. I check them all and they're A, X, I, and G as well. No change there. Nothing so far is any, in any way profound. Let's drop the table, recreate it like we did before. Let's insert those 200 rows, each 100 bytes long again, and this time turn on enable row movement. Once again, ultimately really designed for partition tables. Here's my row IDs, A, X, I, and G. Update my rows. And look at this, A, C, N, and G. So anyone who's familiar with row IDs is probably just about falling off their chair by now because this is a non-partition table and normally people have assumed for decades that unless you delete and insert a row, the row ID will never change. And on autonomous, that is no longer the case. Let me go back to the slides and we'll explain why. So that's the demo. So where does this come around? Well, number one is it's an autonomous database. That's what you sign up for when you use autonomous. It's a database that is self-managing. It makes decisions on its own to work out how to best look after your data. And one of those things is things like it can move data on its own volition. And that's what it does. Apex, for example, if you've gone down the apex path of saying, you know, I don't need primary keys, which is the default, I'm going to use the row ID as a way of locating all my rows. 
Well, you might get yourself into a bit of grief because we were never encouraging people to do that. But people always thought, Rowardies never change. It'll be fine. So let's have a look at what happens on an Apex machine. If you're, for example, running Apex on Autonomous and you've gone against the recommendations and using Rowardy. It's very large, isn't it? Okay. It's also probably a very small font. Okay, so let's make it a bit larger. Hope that you can all see that. As you can see, I've spent very little time building this little simple table in Apex. It is just effectively four columns, each of one byte. It's a report. I've built this badly. I've said all the navigation between screens, etc., will be done with the row ID and not with the primary key. So let's go and edit one of these rows. Let's load. Okay, so if I make the row a little bit bigger and apply the changes. Okay, no problems. It says everything's fine because there's probably enough room for that table to go back into where that row to go back into where it was. What if I really amp things up a bit? Make this row very large. No guarantees this will work because it, obviously it's the database decides how it's going to deal with the rows. Ah, oh, it didn't work. Oh, maybe I have, maybe row one's not going to work. Let's go back and try again. Let's grab another one. Make that large. Oh. Bang. That's what I was hoping to see. This is where Apex has done its updates. It said, yep, I know the row at its row. That never changes. I've done the update. Let's now go retrieve that row to put it back on the screen. That row ID no longer exists. The data got moved elsewhere because we're running on autonomous. Let's go back to the slides. So Apex won't know if you go away from the primary key path and start using row IDs on the assumption that row IDs never change. You start getting this kind of stuff. So this is a little bit confronting for us that are, you know, generally always assume row ID is this static thing that never changes. And for that reason, we're actually focusing now on the docs as well. If you look at the original docs, any, any version up until 21, you'll see it says for row ID data types, end users and app developers can also use row IDs for important functions. See how a table is organized. It's the fastest means of accessing a row and their unique identifiers for rows in a given table. This is what we're doing to revise those docs because that information is actually not valid. Seeing how a table is organized. Yes, row IDs are good for that. Unique identifiers for rows in a given table. No, not true because clusters have always had the ability to have the same row ID point to multiple rows. So that's being removed. And the fastest means of accessing particular rows. Well, that might be true, but that's assuming that row IDs never change. So we're changing this to be row IDs are the fastest means of reaccessing a row if its row ID has previously been retrieved with a select statement. If you've gone and retrieved a row ID, lock those rows, then those rows are static for your duration of your transaction and you can happily use them. You can't go grab a set of row IDs, stick it in a table or grab a set of row IDs, come back in 15 minutes and guarantee that those row IDs are still going to be present because things can happen. On autonomous, they can happen by themselves. On other databases, any DBA could come along behind the scenes and do some sort of action which changes the row ID. Similarly in the docs, we have thing identifying rows by address. And the only thing we have in the docs at the moment, it says, if you update a row in HCC, the row ID might change. We're revising those docs to say this. The row ID for a, for a row may change for a number of reasons which may be user initiated or internally by the database engine. I want to highlight that. You cannot depend on the row ID to be pointing to the same row or a valid row at all after any of these operations have occurred, yielding unpredictable or incorrect results. I want to stress that. This has actually always been the case. Ever since we've been able to do operations such as shrink space flashback, which is Oracle 9, then the ability for a table to look as if it's online, no changes, but the row IDs change has always been there. Autonomous is now basically taking that to another level because it's actively making your data better by shuffling rows around without your knowledge. 
This is the one thing that you can guarantee to be safe when using a row ID. You can select the row ID in preparation for doing some updates and lock those rows. That is the only way you can guarantee those rows are going to stay in a, you know, those row IDs are going to stay in a state of in, in a constant state. You've locked those rows. They can't be moved anywhere. When you, when you come back, you can now come back and do an update with a row ID, either a single row ID, or this could be a bulk collect and a batch of row IDs or array processing, et cetera. But try to get this into your app development mindset now, which is row IDs can be used as long as you grab them, lock them, and use them. The concept of just storing them, retrieving them, and just assuming they're always going to work is, was never really valid and is definitely no longer valid going forward. So, Judith asked a question about what happens with materialized views that contain row IDs, et cetera, et cetera. Let me uh, get to a couple more slides, which will help uh, explain that for you, Judith. I should say, you should expect this more often. The database is constantly evolving, especially on an on autonomous side of things, to be proactive with your data. For example, automatic partitioning. We can take a table which is non-partitioned and make it a partition table Unbeknown to you, under the covers, you have to turn it on, that facility, but in autonomous, we can reshuffle data to actually make it more productive for you. And, and the bottom line, <laughs> without being sort of too callous about it, is the row ID is ours, not yours. Think of it that way. So as Judith has pointed out, we use the row ID for all sorts of things. DBMS Parallel Execute has mechanisms for using the row ID. The chained rows table stores row IDs. The exceptions table, materialized views have row ID columns in them shrink space, flashback, all these facilities use the row ID. And they even expose it sometimes in queries or in columns or in materialized view definitions. However, these are all things managed by Oracle and therefore it's our responsibility to look after things like row IDs moving, changing, etc. Our functionality will take care of those uh, anomalous behaviors. What we're saying is unless you're prepared to do the same amount of work, be aware that the row ID can't be something you can rely on as being constant. It, you never could, but people just sort of tended to flirt around those boundary cases. Now, those cases are growing. The row ID is much more fluid than it used to be. So just wanted to really stress that. Okay. Okay, Rachel said, can you explain why Apex uses GUIDs instead of a row ID to auto-generate primary keys? So hopefully that I've answered that row ID is never going to be a good candidate for a primary key. Um, Apex doesn't have to use GUIDs. It's one of the things you, one of the, if you're building something with say quick SQL, it's one of the options you get. They offer GUIDs, um, identity columns, et cetera. Uh, the GUIDs really are a, a measure of our, our Apex's um, history. You go back far enough, we didn't have identity columns. They came in in Oracle 12 and we didn't, um, the, the common practice of using a sequence, we didn't have defaults of sequences until Oracle 12. And so you had to use a trigger as well. And so people said, well, rather than having a trigger to populate a primary key, we may as well use a GUID because it, we can, don't have to have triggers, less code, less maintenance, et cetera. So Apex is probably just showing its history there, its age, the fact that we opted for GUIDs. Um, but if you're using Quick SQL, you can choose between identity columns, which I think are now the default uh, because that functionality is there. And as well as GUIDs are still there or even triggers if you uh, need that as well. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, how are we going for time? Oh man, it's just a nightmare. We'll try to get a few, a few come up which are hopefully fairly quick. Good drink. Oh, <coughs> don't read a question <coughs> and drink water at the same time. <coughs> Excuse me. Someone said, this is a generic question about table reorganization. Do you recommend reorganizing a table due to chained rows? Uh, yes and no. Let me, <coughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> oh, this water is very strong. Um, chained rows are only a problem is if you have to follow those chains. So for example, if you have a table which does predominantly full table scans that you're, you're doing a reporting data warehouse, there's no cost in having chained rows because the database simply, when it sees one of these stubs saying a row has been moved, simply ignores it, knowing that it'll encounter the row somewhere else in the full table scan. So it's not going to cost you to do a full table scan if your table has lots of chained rows. I wouldn't bother reorging it. 
if that full table span has predicates on columns, well, it might be impacted then because now we have to follow those chained links to get to the columns to actually extract the predicates. So even though it's a full table scan, it might be impacted. If your table is only accessed via index lookups, then by definition, you'll be doing extra work because the index always points to the little stub, which points to the newly relocated row. So you need to understand effectively the behaviors of your application. And also one of the things you can look at is your system statistics. Look at your stats for, there's various stats that have, uh, it's called fetch or access by continued row. That means that's the amount of times you actually had to follow one of those links to get the chained row. So if that number is huge, then you might want to look at doing a reorg. If that number is low, then I wouldn't worry about it. Hope that answers that question. And the best thing is that now gives me someone to blame for us running late or not getting our work done. So, so my apologies, Bally. Sequence table linkage. How do I find the sequences? Sorry, let me start again in proper English. How do I find which sequences are bound to a table? I was expecting table name column on user sequences or something similar, but I couldn't find it. Let me explain that with a demo. There might be a link between sequences and tables, or there might not be. And let's explore both options. Let's create a sequence attractively named blah. And I'll create a table called T1, and I'll have my X defaults to blah.nextval. That's a really cool thing that came in as in 12.c, the ability to have a sequence as a default for a column. If I go look at user tables, this is just the user table columns printed down the screen for T1. There's really nothing in there. There's no column called sequence name. So there's nothing in user tables that says that this sequence is somehow bound to a table. Conversely, if I flip the query around and go look at user sequences, you'll see that there's nothing in here that says it's bound to a particular table name. And that's because by default, a normal sequence and a table, even if you use them in this default context, don't have any real binding together because I can create another table called T2 or a table called T3. They can also reference the sequence as well. It's one to many. There's no real relationship here. I can use this sequence just with a query. I don't have to use it in just the default operation. And in fact, if I insert into T2, I've now got an active transaction that used that sequence. Even with that happening, I can select from T2 and went and picked up sequence value one, which is fine. That transaction is still open. So my sequence was just used. I'm in an active transaction and I can drop it. Doesn't make any difference. It doesn't break anything, right? I haven't, you know, basically blocked anything that that transaction got committed. One thing that will happen though, is if I try to an insert into T3, it's going to say, ah, oh, I need to get blah on next file. That sequence doesn't exist. So it stops you from doing inserts where you needed to use the default. If I didn't use the default, for example, T2, if I nominated a value, didn't use the default, then it works fine. But you can see it's a fairly loose coupling between sequences and tables. And that's why we don't bind them together in this default mechanism of sequences. The one time when we do bind them together is if you use this new generated as identity. This is uh, effectively Oracle's mimicking of what you see in things like SQL Server and other databases where they've had the identity column for a number of versions. We, this for us came in in Oracle 12. Under the covers, we're building a sequence to implement this. It's just a ascending number. But because we're doing it under the covers, it's internal, we manage that relationship between the two. If I go look at user tables, there is one column that says that yes, this has an identity column associated with it, which is this one. So you can only have one identity column for a table. This table has one. How do we implement it? We implement it with a sequence. How do we know the relationship between them? If I go look at the object ID for this table, it's 6494157. The sequence that gets created is I seek dollar dollar followed by the object ID. Now, there's no flag or anything on the user sequences table. In fact, I think we actually show that. Oh, yeah. If I try drop it, I can't drop it anymore because it's now bound to the table. It's being used for the identity. So this particular sequence, because it's an identity sequence, is now known to the database that it's linked to the table. And therefore, you can't just go ahead and drop it like I dropped my sequence called blah. If I go look at user sequences, though, there's nothing on there that says that this is somehow linked to a table 
now that you know the sort of naming convention, you'll know, ah, oh, that's obviously some sort of special sequence. Um, interestingly, it doesn't stop me from creating a sequence with had that name in it. But if I have a normal sequence called blah, which I've just recreated because I dropped it before, how would I tell between these two sequences? How do I know that's an internal one besides a special name? Well, the only really way you can see is by hunting around in one of the internal dictionary tables called sys.seq$, and there's a flags column. And for these ones, you can see there's an extra 32, which is the fifth bit. So there's a bit string here or bit flag that's been set for an identity sequence. But really, we shouldn't have to go hunting around you know, deep in the data dictionary to find this out. Uh, hopefully, we'll add something in there besides just the identity column on user tables. But for the time being, you just need to know that if it's I seek dollar dollar, then it's most likely an internal sequence. The reason I say most likely is there's nothing to stop you from creating your own sequence with that name. I would strongly not recommend that because eventually you will come up to this object ID. The database doesn't know you created a sequence like this and you'll create a, sequ an, a table, say has identity. The database will use an object ID of 77710036 It'll try to create the sequence and you'll get an internal error and your table doesn't get created. So be aware of that. Um, I did a, did a play with this to actually you know, create a, a 10,000 sequence to see what would happen. And yeah, you simply can't create a table with that identity once you hit that object number, which is why I'm dropping it now so I don't mess up my database. Oh, look, here we go. Uh, this is why I love office hours, everyone, right? It's two-way learning. Oren's just chipped in with, if you go to user tab identity columns, uh, there's a sequence same column. So we have a view that came in in 12.102. Awesome stuff. I'll update the slides, but yeah, thanks, Oren. This is why I love office hours. It's free education for me. How are we going for time? 9.59. Yeah, I think, I think we're done. What have we got? Let me wrap up these here. So just to wrap up this topic, yeah, you only get the linkage for identity sequences, not for standard sequences, but that's the correct thing because a standard sequence can be used for any number of tables or no tables at all. And as I said, whatever you do, don't name a sequence I seek dollar dollar NNNN. We don't stop you. I wish we would. But if you uh, inadvertently ended up with a object number collision, then you'd be in trouble. Thank you very much for your time. I was trying to get through eight. I didn't even get close, which is disappointing, even though I rushed. Um, I'm going to blame the Q&A. That's a great way of <laughs> absolving myself of responsibility. But no, in, in, in reality, I would happily get through only one topic and have all the Q&A that we had tonight. Um, I like the fact that these are interactive. It means we're learning. And as we saw, you know, we learned, I learned something as well, which is awesome. That's why I love people participating both ways. Before I remove that slide, no office hours next month. My apologies for that. I'll be at K-Scope and then heading from there very similarly quickly after that to India. So I won't have time to do an office hours, my apologies. But as always, thank you very much for giving up your time. I very much appreciate it. And thank you for the interaction. Um, I love the fact that we had this dialogue going back and forth. I think it, it brings me all, once again, feeling closer to a feeling of true community. And hopefully we all learn something and we all can thrive and be more successful with our Oracle database technology. Thanks again for your time. I'll see you somewhere out on the intertube somewhere on Twitter. If not, I'll see you when we next run our office hour session. Bye for now, everyone. Have a good day or good night.